All right. So, uh, yeah. Um, Tony, since you're here, would you like to lead? What? To present Harish? Yes. Uh, okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, uh, more people will, will join a bit later, hopefully. So whoever is here, welcome this uh, uh, seminar. We're very happy that uh, Harish uh, agreed to uh, give this talk, which should be very exciting. So with just a few words, not to waste time, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, 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 Dr. Har Harish Vendatam. Am I pronouncing it correctly? No, you're almost right. Yeah, Vedantam. You're, you're basically that. Yeah. Uh, who is a star astronomer at uh, the uh, uh, the Netherlands Institute of Astronomy or Astron? And uh, interestingly, he's from engineering background as well. So. Um, also, his interests uh, are varied. As far as I know, you're also interested in FRBs and the interstellar medium. Uh, so very, very different topics from one another, but he's going to talk to us about uh, detecting uh, stellar and extrasolar uh, stars and extrasolar planets using the uh, low far telescope. So Rish, uh, the stage is yours. All right, thanks, Tony. Thanks, Carmen, uh, for inviting me. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, and like Tony said, I'll be talking a bit about the work I'm doing, uh, I've been doing in the last some, something like two or three years, where in some sense, observationally, at least, the field has really taken off because of LOFAR in large part. Uh, and I, I understand that we have a also a varied audience in that they're probably students and uh, people who are not directly working in this field. And so I've put in a lot of material, which is um, sort of more generic and introductory, uh, at least in, in the first half of the talk. And so if people like Tony were already in the field, I'm sorry if I bore you <laughs> by telling you things you've known for like 10 years or something. All right, with that said, um, let's get to it. So I'm gonna talk, talk mainly about extrasolar systems, but of course I'll draw from experiences, uh, uh, experience of our own solar system because that's the system we have studied the best so far, including the sun and the planets. Uh, and I'm mainly talking about radio emission. Um, so I'll not be talking about all the fantastic work that happens in the optical X-ray, uh, infrared, those kind of bands. And I wanna start by uh, kind of broadly framing uh, what radio astronomy can really do in these kind of systems. And the best way I like to think about it is if you imagine a stellar system like star and some planets, uh, the two are interacting. So the star and the planets, they interact uh, mainly via three mechanisms. So one is just gravity. That's what makes the planets go around tides and things like that. Uh, the second is radiation. So that's what we have most direct connection to because we feel that the sun you know, heats us when we go out. So we really directly feel that radiation. Gravity, we don't directly feel, maybe when we see tides, we, we kind of feel the effect of gravity. Uh, but there's a third one, which is equally important, which uh, more or less we don't feel in our everyday life, uh, but is ex extremely important when it accumulates over billions of years. Uh, and the third one is electrodynamic. So in, when I say electrodynamic, I'm talking about plasma, magnetic fields, these kind of aspects. Um, and these are extremely important uh, in, 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 in determining whether a planet can host life, uh, what kind of atmosphere it can have, what chemistry it, uh, the atmosphere can support, uh, and what is the rate of atmospheric erosion from a planet. So these effects really play out over billion year time scales. Well, there's one way we do directly experience this effect if you live really far up north. Uh, and apparently, even if you're in Northern Europe in the last few days, uh, but I never got to see the Northern Lights. So those are the Northern Lights. And maybe some of you have seen it, if you're lucky, I haven't. Uh, this is an electrodynamic effect. So the Northern Lights are created because there are high energy charged particles coming from the sun, which impact the Earth's atmosphere. And what you see really is the fluorescent emission, uh, in, in, you know, shown in this beautiful picture. 
Okay, so if, if outside of our direct experience, if we want to take a step back and say, what, what does plas what do plasma and magnetic fields do in the solar system, for example, uh, one thing which immediately comes to my, uh, you know, comes to our focus is the plasma which is which the sun is putting out. So the sun is con continuously putting out a wind of plasma, and that wind impacts on the planets. It can erode the atmospheres, like I said. But occasionally there is a big flare on the sun. So you can think of the flare as some kind of an explosion on the surface of the sun, and it ejects an enormous amount of plasma into the interplanetary medium. It can also be accompanied by uh, a beam of high energy or relativistic particles. And all of these, you know, when they impact the Earth, they can change the chemistry of the atmosphere. So for example, when you get hit by a beam of relativistic particles, it can influence ozone and nitrous oxide chemistries. And there is some, there's some uh, evidence to even say that billions of years ago, uh, it's because of this kind of chemical reactions that we got some probiotic molecules on the earth. So there, there might be some direct link to life there as well, uh, not just protecting the atmosphere, so in this case, eroding the atmosphere. Now, if you see this from the point of view of a planet, in this case, the earth, uh, it's getting bombarded right, by this plasma, but it has its own sort of a defense mechanism, which is the magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, and the magnetic field really creates like a little cavity or a cocoon, and it protects the atmosphere of the Earth. Uh, and you know the, the impact of that is immediately relevant when you compare Earth and Mars. Mars doesn't have a magnetic field, and it has lost about half of its primordial atmosphere uh, because the solar wind can just erode the atmosphere over long time scales. Now, radio is pretty unique in probing these events because an unambiguous signature of this kind of plasma ejection appears in the radio band uh, in the form of a burst. I'll show you an example soon. And also on the planet side, we don't really know of another mechanism by which we can directly measure the magnetic field of a planet remotely, not going there, but just remotely measuring it, other than looking at its radio emission. Uh, and the mechanism there is cyclotron. So by looking at the frequency of emission, you can say what is the magnetic field strength at the site of the emitter. So here's an example of a, what I call this plasma ejection event uh, as seen in the radio band on the sun. So what you're seeing is frequency on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, uh, and the color tells you what is the brightness of the emission. And you see this kind of uh, um, drift uh, a drift in frequency. So as you go to later times, you see emission at lower and lower frequencies. And this is created by a mechanism called plasma emission. And the nice thing about this is the emission happens at the local plasma frequency, which only depends on the number density of charged particles, as I've shown in this equation. So if you know the frequency, you know the electron density. And so what's happening is there's a big shock that is moving out uh, in the corona towards the planets, towards the interplanetary medium. And as it encounters regions of lower and lower electron density, it emits at lower and lower frequencies. And that's why you see this kind of a frequency sweep. So you do see these occasionally from the sun and they are a pretty unambiguous way to say that a large mass of plasma has left the sun uh, and is going into the interplanetary medium. And just to preface the rest of the talk, we have never seen these kind of uh, signals. We've never been able to detect these kind of signals from any star other than the sun so far. Now, it's not just the sun and the earth system where this, there are some very nice electrodynamic effects. In our own solar system, we also have uh, some really interesting things going on in the outer planets, the gas giants planets, uh, and the classic exam, the kind of poster child for that is Jupiter. Um, these systems are pretty interesting for, for studying plasmas and magnetic fields because Jupiter is highly magnetized. Its surface field is about 15 Gauss. So in some sense, it's comparable to the fridge magnets we all have in, in strength. So, but it's the size of Jupiter, right? So it's an enormous magnet in that sense. Uh, and it's spinning very rapidly, right? And so you have a ma magnet that is spinning rapidly and the magnetosphere of Jupiter, so the area around Jupiter has a lot of plasma, which is conductive because there are free electrons. So you really have a setup that is very similar to what you would have in an electric generator, right? This is how you would generate uh, current uh, by, you know, in a, in a power station. So you have a coil which is rotating in a magnetic field, 
in this case, the magnet rotates basically. You, you just need the differential velocity between the charges and the, and the magnet to, to basically set up Faraday induction and a giant current system. So Jupiter has this enormous current system. It's about 1 billion amperes uh, that moves in its magnetosphere. And this ultimately also powers radio emission. And we can detect that radio emission and you know, measure a lot of properties of Jupiter. It's not, so here's an example of that emission. So I'm showing you this emission in the, again in the time frequency plane. And in this case, the emission appears as, as a lot of spiky uh, kind of a narrow frequency bursts. Uh, and what you're seeing here is, is a maser mechanism. So this is similar to um, the lasers, which you might be familiar with, but this is happening in the radio band. So what you're getting is a small site where there is very intense maser action and a lot of energy is liberated and the maser shuts down and another site comes, comes into view and then, you know, that's why you get these banded structures. Now, the nice thing about this emission is that the frequency of emission only depends on the magnetic field strength of the emitter. So this is a direct way to measure magnetic fields. And we don't know of any other way to, to measure magnetic fields like this on, on an exoplanet. We can do it on stars using Zeeman splitting, which is a quantum mechanical effect, but we can't do that on the really cold objects. Um, this emission is also beam. So you get some kind of a lighthouse effect. So the emission goes into only preferable directions. And as Jupiter rotates, you get an effect which is similar to a lighthouse, uh, which some of you might have seen if you go to the sea coast. Um, and this is, an ex this is basically a very early measurement of that effect. So what you're seeing here is the polarization angle of, of the emission and the flux density of, of Jupiter's emission as a function of longitude. So as a function of rotational phase of Jupiter, and you can clearly see that rotational modulation, and you know, this is stable over many, many rotations. And you can actually use this to work out the rotation period of Jupiter, which if you think about extending to exoplanets is quite remarkable because we don't have an easy way to find out the rotation rates of exoplanets. But you can just do that using just this light, lighthouse kind of effect uh, if you can detect the radio emissions. Now, Jupiter also has uh, the Galilean moons. So in this case, Io. Uh, and again, Io has, is very volcanic, which means that it puts out a lot of volcanic ash around it. And all, a lot of the alkali metals in that ash get ionized. So you again have a conductive atmosphere around Io. And you again have the same kind of dynam the electrical generator effect. And there is another component of emission that is tied to Io. And we know that because we see this emission preferentially when Io is in certain parts of its orbit. So here I'm showing again Jupiter's emission uh, where it's plotted against the orbital phase of Io and the rotational phase of Jupiter. And you see that the emission always clusters around some point. So it kind of tells you that Io is controlling the emission of Jupiter. And again, if you think about expanding this to the extrasolar frontier, you might be able to detect exomoons with this technique. And currently, we don't know of any other technique where we can easily find moon around an exoplanet, uh, other than using some, uh, some kind of a radio astronomical effect like that. All right, so all of this is kind of a setup to, to kind of tell you about what I think the next frontier is. The next frontier is to take all of this from the solar system out to an extrasolar system. And so you can kind of uh, break it down into things which which are technologically within our reach and things which are slightly futuristic, which maybe is for the 2030s. So on the top is the yellow part, which I would argue is technologically within reach with, with the telescopes we have now. And that is to detect these plasma ejection events on other stars uh, other than the sun. And so we can ask questions of what is the rate of these events on stars of different ages, mass, and using that, you can sort of build a comprehensive view of what kind of environment exoplanets actually experience around stars of not just different, um, uh, different masses or spectral types, but also at different points in their life. So you can even look at a solar analog star, which is very young compared to the sun, and get an idea of what the environment the Earth must have experienced, let's say, two billion years ago or something like that, right? And so you can start answering these interesting questions by making these detections of, of these mass ejection events. The second part is to discover 
these kind of giant exoplanets like Jupiter like exoplanets using radio observations. So it'll be a nice alternate way to discover these planets compared to, in, in addition to what we already have. But of course, here you get something very unique, which is you get to measure their magnetic fields, which means that you can actually start testing some of the models we have. These are called dynamo models, which predict the magnetic field strengths of exoplanets, right? So we can actually start empirically testing them. And of course, if we keep timing, if once we have a detection, we, when we look for the rotational modulation, uh, maybe we'll discover moons around these planets and that'll be a really exciting way uh, to you know just discover exomoons in in uh, in our neighborhood now of course something a little more futuristic is to detect radio emission from an earth like exoplanet so i showed you the a picture of the aurora they are also associated with radio emissions in case of the earth but they are at very low frequencies so in case of the earth the emission is um, at frequencies which are far less than a megahertz or a megahertz or lower and we can't observe these frequencies uh, from a ground-based telescope because our own atmosphere is opaque to these frequencies. Uh, there's an ionized layer in our own atmosphere, which is opaque. And so we really have to build an enormous telescope at very low frequencies, uh, either in space or on the moon. So it's a little more futuristic, uh, but something which a lot of us are interested in pushing forward. Okay, so let's go to the kind of the extra solar frontier. So we're leaving the solar system now and going to other stellar systems. Uh, and the main thing I wanted to keep in mind before we go there is that our solar system is quite specific in that we have a types, we have a particular type of star and we have a particular planetary arrangement in the solar system. And there's a vast diversity once you go to other systems. So for example, the vast majority of stars are not as big as the sun. They're actually much smaller than the sun and colder than the sun. And they actually have a stronger magnetic field than the sun. So here I'm showing an example of one such star. It's, these stars are called red dwarfs or M dwarfs, uh, which is, uh, which is you know, right next to the sun here in this image. I don't know if you can see my pointer. I myself cannot see my pointer, sorry. So anyway, the star right next to the sun is, is, is a red dwarf star. And you go to smaller and smaller object and there's a whole continuum of objects until you reach what we would call a Jupiter or a, or a, or a gas giant exoplanet. And there, it's not like there are stars and planets and nothing in between. We have a continuum of objects because you know nature makes everything that is possible to make. And these are called brown dwarfs. So these are really kind of giant cousins of Jupiter-like exoplanets. And all of these systems, one commonality in them is they have strong magnetic fields, just like Jupiter has strong magnetic fields. Um, so they're, they end up being strong radio emitters and we can actually use those emissions to kind, to, to, to kind of do the inference which we've already done on Jupiter many decades ago. So that's kind of the basic frame to keep in mind. Now, of course, what would, you can ask the question, what would an extrasolar system look like given everything we know about the solar system? Uh, and the first thing that you know, is, is immediately in some sense handicapping is in the solar system, we can point our telescope to individual objects and maybe even resolve those objects. We make an image of the sun and you can have hundreds of pixels on the sun because everything is so close by. Now, if you look at this kind of a stellar system from um, from far away, like from, uh, from a planet in orbit around another star, all you'll see is just a single point of light. Uh, you won't be really able to resolve all of that. So that's the first problem in that you have to be a little more ingenious in figuring out what you are seeing, because all you see is a single point of light and all you have is a polarization time and frequency information to figure out what is what and where the emission is coming from. So let's, let's do this thought experiment. Let's say that we are an alien civilization and we are looking at the solar system from some planetary system around the star far away. What would we see? Well, if here's, here is a flux density on the y-axis versus wavelength in microns in the x-axis and black is actual data. This is basically the solar thermal emission. So this is what the sun is putting out. It peaks somewhere around uh, wavelength of something like half a micron, which is corresponds to green light. Um, and you see the, you know, the Planck law with some wiggles there, which have to do with different effects of radiative transfer in the atmosphere of the sun. But more or less, you see the Planck's black body curve 
And if you keep extending it, which is the blue line there, to longer and longer wavelengths, so you now appear, you now come closer and closer to radio frequencies. So we're going away from the optical on the right side of the plot is radio. Uh, you kind of expect something like that. That's basically the what is called the Rayleigh gene style of, of the Planck function. When you actually go ahead and measure it, you see something like that. Uh, so it's completely different, right? And so right from that, you can immediately say that at these long wavelengths or radio frequencies, you're actually not looking at the photosphere of the sun at all. That's not thermal emission. Now it turns out that that bump you see there, where I mark the arrow, is the emission coming from the corona of the sun. Uh, these are all the high energy particles in the corona of the sun. These are mostly relativistic particles which are emitting uh, some kind of uh, synchrotron uh, by the synchrotron mechanism, which is what you see in the radio. But here's the really interesting part. If you go to long enough wavelengths, the brightest thing in the solar system is not the sun, it's actually Jupiter. And so immediately in that spectrum of that one pixel, uh, with some clever theory applied to it, you could basically immediately say that there is an exoplanet there which is emitting this kind of cyclotron emission. So you can figure out that there is Jupiter in this system. And not just that, every now and then, uh, you would see that the spectrum goes haywire uh, for a brief period of time. And that is when the sun does something interesting. So this is what I was just speaking about. So this would, um, these are the flares on the sun which give rise to these kind of transient signals. Uh, some of them are accompanied by this mass ejection event. So you can figure out that this star has a coronal mass ejection. Uh, you can figure out that there are planets around this star with the measure their magnetic fields, for example. So you can figure out a whole lot. And if you observe this long enough, you can even figure out that this planet Jupiter has moons around it, uh, just from the radio emission from that one point of light that comes to you. Okay, so what really stops us from doing all of this? Why hasn't all of this already been done? Because we know what we're looking for. I would say it's a combination of two things. One is sensitivity, and the other is you need a lot of patience to do this. Uh, so what do you mean by sensitivity? Now, Jupiter is roughly at five astronomical units. That's about 10 to the 14 centimeters. Uh, if you look at the nearest, one, some of the nearest stars, which might have Jupiters around them, they're about 10 light years from us. These are some of the nearest stars to us. So that's 10 to the 19 centimeters. Now, if you just put in the inverse square law, you immediately see that their flux is going to be 10 billion times smaller, right? I mean, this thing is extremely faint compared to what you would expect from Jupiter. So A, you need a massive telescope to be able to reach this sensitivity and B, you will still be looking at systems which are far more energetic than Jupiter. Those are the first ones you will detect. It won't be exactly Jupiter. You would be looking at some kind of super Jupiter, which is very energetic. Now, the second thing is patience. And again, if you want to find this, this plasma ejection event I'm talking about, if you look at the really the most energetic of these kind of solar flares which give out coronal mass ejections, they don't happen all that often. The weaker events happen more often than the really strong ones. And you know the strong ones can happen once in a few years. The really strong ones probably happen once in a lifetime, which means that you need to be staring at this point of light for a very long time. And a typical large telescope program gives you about thousand hours, right? And so you need some kind of a different strategy to be able to find these, these events. It can't be that you pick a star and you stare at it for thousands of hours. Uh, so you need, a, you need a, some kind of a clever strategy on, on top of having a super sensitive telescope. And so that's where, um, that's, in those aspects, we are in a pretty unique point in, in the history of radio astronomy in that we now have these new telescopes, which are incredibly sensitive. They're, they're, or, they're at least an order of magnitude, sometimes two orders of magnitude, depending on frequency, more sensitive than anything that has come before. So the one I'll be mostly focusing on is the one I show on the left here, which is LOFAR. And I'm assuming a lot of you have already heard of LOFAR, so I don't, doesn't need introduction here, but just to remind you, it's observing at very low frequencies, about 30 to 200 megahertz. And that's perfect because all the signals I've been talking about, they all appear at this low frequency. So these frequencies are comparable, you know, in terms of they're very close to the frequencies at which the 
FM broadcast happens. So FM broadcast happens around 100 megahertz. So you know, think of really low frequencies here. And if you look at the total amount of area over which we collect radio waves with low fire, uh, it's about 0.1 square kilometer. So that's enormous. That's an enormous amount of collecting area. And all of that is composed of a huge network of simple dipole antennas. So there are tens of thousands of dipole antennas, which are spread all over Netherlands and Europe, and hopefully soon in Bulgaria, where these signals are collected. Um, and the nice thing about LOFAR is also, it's kind of a software telescope. So it's not like a dish which you point at a point in the sky. You can actually do the pointing of the telescope electronically. And so because of that, you can look at multiple directions at the same time. And that really helps you in that second aspect I spoke about, the, the patience you need. Well, in this case, you don't need a lot of patience because you can see multiple stars at the same time. So, you know, you really cut down on how much time you need um, on the telescope to make these discoveries. Another aspect is LOFAR has a huge field of view. So the amount of sky the telescope is looking at a, at a given point is so big that in the nearby universe, there are hundreds, you know, of the order hundred stars in every LOFAR pointing which means that you, know, you get that boost of 100 times. You're simultaneously looking at 100 stars uh, and you're doing this simultaneously in many directions. So that, so that LOFAR really solves those two problems of sensitivity and you know, just the time on sky you need to make these discoveries. And I also want to you know, give a shout out on the right to, to a telescope in India, which is GMRT. GMRT is, is kind of an older technology where you have dishes and you point them at a certain point in sky, but it has a fantastic spectral coverage. So it goes all the way, it covers the entire band from about 100 to uh, 1450 megahertz, so that decade in bandwidth, and it's quite sensitive as well. So once you make some discovery with a wide field camera like LOFAR, it can be a pretty interesting uh, telescope to do follow up at different frequencies. So this combination is, is in, in some sense quite unique. Okay, so I'll, I'll now move a little more into the work I've been doing in the, in, in the rest of the time I have. Uh, and what, I've, what I'm really focusing on right now is to really exploit a survey which is going on with LOFAR. So LOFAR is conducting a survey of the entire available nor northern sky, the entire sky which is you know, visible from the Netherlands. We're at a pretty high latitude. Um, and it's doing at a three different frequency bands, which are shown uh, on the x-axis is frequency. So the three acronyms you see, LOTS, LOLS, and LOTS, these are just the three different frequency bands where we conduct the survey. And each circle here is a different survey, right? And, and the size of the circle tells you the angular resolution of the survey, the power to resolve two sources which are close to each other. And, I mean, it's, and on the y-axis is the sensitivity. So it's immediately clear that we are having huge gains in sensitivity. That's because LOFAR is an enormous telescope. And we also have a huge gain in angular resolution. Uh, and that's because LOFAR has stations distributed over a huge geographical area, right? And so even with a radio telescope, the resolution you get is basically the diffraction limit. It's lambda by D. Lambda is a wavelength, which is quite large in the radio. So you want D also to be really large. And so you really want to spread out your antennas uh, over, over a large geographical area. And so that's why a lot of LOFAR stations are on different European countries, which really gives that fantastic resolution uh, which we need. So having one in Bulgaria is gonna really make an enormous east-west baseline from Ireland to Bulgaria, uh, really improve that angular resolution, which is quite uh, kind of a unique thing for LOFAR. Uh, there's no other telescope at these frequencies that can come anywhere close to this angular resolution. Anyway, so the, the interesting thing now is we have high sensitivity and we have tens of thousands of hours on sky because we are doing a large sky survey. So why not use that data to find the signals we have been find, you know, which we are after. Uh, and so that's what I've been working on. So what we do is kind of summarized here in a very simplistic way. So we get the survey data, each point of sky is observed for eight hours um, and the total amount of time on telescope for this is goes into you know tens of thousands of hours. So it's an enormous amount of data. The whole data set is close to about 20 petabytes uh, when it will be fully complete. So it's an enormous survey and a huge amount of data. And it's the largest radio survey by source density by a large margin. Um, 
Okay, so what we do is as the survey data comes in, there is a pipeline that processes all of the data, does all the hard work. Uh, that's been about five to 10 years of blood, sweat and tears of a lot of people to get a pipeline working. Um, and what we do is we're really looking for two different things. So on the left-hand side, um, I show a, a, a branch where we're looking for circularly polarized sources. And the reason we do that is most radio sources are not stars or exoplanets. They're all extragalactic. They're all active galactic nuclei, black hole jets, that kind of stuff. Uh, and none of them are circularly polarized. The only circularly polarized sources we know of are either pulsars, are stars, or these brown dwarfs or exoplanets, which I spoke about. So immediately you get rid of a vast majority of sources because they're all extragalactic, we're not interested. Other people are interested in that. And so it really comes down to figuring out what the source is once you found the circularly polarized source. And there are many ways to do that. We know how to look for pulsars. We know how to find stars. You point an optical telescope, you'll know if it's a star. And you point an infrared telescope and you'll know if it's a brown dwarf or this kind of colder object. Uh, and so, you know, we go through a decision tree there to figure out what the object really is. On the right-hand side, which we have only gotten started now to do because it's a huge data processing challenge, is to find these bursts which have a free sweep in their frequency, in the time frequency plane. Uh, and that is to look for these coronal mass ejections and these relativistic particle beams. They're called energetic particle events on the sun. Uh, and so we've really only gotten started there. So most of the results I'll show you for the rest of the talk are really on the left-hand side of the branch here uh, with the circularly polarized sources. So with that in mind, for the rest of the talk, uh, I just want to highlight you know, three results which we got in the last couple of years. Um, and this is not like an exhaustive list, but I just have picked three just to you know, illustrate the kind of new science that we can do when you have a telescope, which is unique like LOFAR in its sensitivity and its field of view and its capabilities. So the, the first one I wanna talk about is this red dwarf. So this is again a star much colder than the sun. These stars end up usually being highly magnetized unlike the sun or st have strong magnetic fields. So, here is a discovery image. So the two frames you see are images taken with the LOFAR surveys data on two different epochs. So these, the dates are on the top. Uh, and you see the source in one of the epochs and you don't see it in the other epoch. And the insets in, in this images, so the box inside the image is um, not, not the total intensity, but the circularly polarized intensity. So you see that the source is highly circularly polarized. And you know we now have extremely good catalogs of where all the stars are. And so, you know, we know where all the stars are and this one exactly lines up on a star. So we know that the emission is coming from that particular stellar system. And so, because we have eight hours of data, we can also break up the data into chunks of one hour each and then, you know, see how the flux density varies as a function of time, which I show on the left. And we can see how it varies as a function of frequency, which I see on the show on the right. So you immediately see that this is not some kind of a flare related emission, like, like the example I showed you from the sun. So this is not coming from uh, you know, a sudden flare on the star or some kind of a ejection on the star. This is more this kind of continuous emission. Uh, so it's similar to what you see from Jupiter. So you, as long as Jupiter rotates, it keeps emitting because the, the, the Faraday induction keeps happening and it keeps emitting. So it's a more continuous mechanism rather than a flare. Um, another interesting thing, uh, I don't expect everyone to appreciate this plot, but for at least people who work on this kind of fields, this star which we found, which is GJ1151, uh, if you compare it to a prototypical star, which is called a prototypical flare star. So these are flares which, uh, stars which have highly energetic flares and radio emission associated with them. It's completely different. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not a very active star. It doesn't have flares. We even looked at the test data on this star and we cannot find a single flare on this star. So it's a very quiescent star. And so all of this led us to conclude that this kind of emission is not sun-like. It's not coming from these flares or, or kind of explosions on the surface of the star. Uh, this is something different. This is looking more and more similar to what Jupiter does uh, with a strong magnetic field and a magnetosphere around the star. And so again, if you apply the Jovian model, you can create, you have two options to create this current, which gives you the radio emission. One is you can just have the star spinning 
Uh, and the other is you can have an exoplanet around the star in the same way Io goes around Jupiter and induces this emission. Now in this case, in this star's case, it's pretty interesting that we can actually rule out the first case, the solo case. And the reason for that is the rotation period of the star, the last line in this table. It's extremely slow. The star is rotating at a period of 125 days. I mean, as, for comparison, Jupiter rotates once every 10 hours. So there's just not enough V cross V Lorentz force in this system. There's not enough uh, differential velocity in this system to actually create, to power the radio emission. So we, by elimination, we basically came to the conclusion that the most likely explanation is there's an exoplanet around this star and it's inducing emission in a way which is very similar to what Io does on Jupiter. Uh, and so, you know, this kind of the artist impression we made for, for this result, where you have this red, red dwarf star and you have an exoplanet, and there is a current, uh, plasma current going between the star and the planet, uh, and it is inducing emission on the star, just like Io induces emission on, on, on Jupiter. Okay, so the second result I want to highlight is um, an discovery of an object which we named Elekhas. So this is, I mean, the name itself is not important, but it's kind of a nod to the fact that it, the discovery was made with a, uh, with Lofar, with, with a huge involvement of the Netherlands. And Elekhas is a, a kind of a folk character in one of the folk tales. Uh, anyway, so this object is also has a nice discovery story. So this is basically the discovery image. So what I'm showing here is uh, an image of the sky made with LOFAR with the surveys data. Uh, and I put a circle on the source, which I want to bring your attention to, which is this source. Uh, and what you're seeing now is total intensity. So Stokes I, uh, and if you look at the same field in circularly polarized light, so that is Stokes V, you can see that you know all the other background sources, they're all extragalactic. So they're not circularly polarized, they're all gone. And there's only one source that stands out. Uh, so you know immediately that this is either a pulsar, a star, a brown dwarf exoplanet, something like that. It's not one of these extragalactic sources. Now things get really interesting if you go to an optical image of this field uh, and you see that there's nothing there. So this cannot be a star. There, there's just no way to hide a star. I mean, pan stars is extremely deep. It's complete to 23rd magnitude and there is no way you can hide a main sequence star. Uh, in this optical image. So it can't be a star. So it has to be a much colder object which does not emit in the optical. So your only options now are, it's either a, a really cold brown dwarf, which is a massive cousin of, of Jupiter-like exoplanets I spoke about, or some kind of a free floating planet because there's no star there. And so it turns out we went on a 10 meter telescope in the infrared and we could detect the infrared emission from this object. So we know now know that it is a brown dwarf. We even managed to get a spectrum. So here I'm showing an infrared spectrum and we were able to say that this is a particularly cold brown dwarf. The spectral type for those of you who are, uh, 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 know about the spectral types of brown dwarfs is T7. So uh, for the others, you can just think of this as an object which has, um, it doesn't have a lot of its own luminosity like stars have. Uh, it's really like uh, a very heavy Jupiter. Think of it as a very heavy Jupiter with a surface temperature of something like 500 or 600 Kelvin, right? And so in, in many cases, this is kind of a big cousin of Jupiter. It's a way to think about it. And so we found this object and this object has this radio emission. And so now, which means that we can start doing the kind of things we used to do with Jupiter. And this is not the first time we have found radio emission from a brown dwarf. Uh, Tony has actually worked on this and you know has, has found radio emission from plenty of brown dwarfs. What was new here is we are observing at a very low frequency. So we are sensitive to finding objects that have weaker magnetic field strength, more, more in the exoplanet regime. So we are really going down the mass, the temperature, and the magnetic field strength ladder, and getting closer and closer to Jupiter uh, by observing at lower frequencies and discovering objects. And the second thing is, we found this object directly in the radio. We didn't point at a known brown dwarf, which was found by other means. And that means that we've demonstrated that you can directly use a radio telescope to discover these extremely cold objects. They're very hard to find with their thermal emission in the infrared because thermal emission goes as temperature to the power four, 
right? That's the Stefan Boltzmann's law. So once you go to lower and lower temperature objects, once you get closer and closer to the boundary with exoplanets, it's just incredibly hard to discover them in a large infrared survey. But radio emission is not thermal. So you can have bright radio emission even from a very cold object. And so the, this kind of gives the confidence that we can use this methodology to directly find, let's say, free floating planets or other exoplanets or these objects which are very close to the brown dwarf planet boundary. And so ever since we found another object, uh, unfortunately, this one was already a known brown dwarf, but it's nice that the more data we look at, the more objects we find. And this one is also interesting because uh, I'm showing you the flux density versus time and it shows pulses. So that means that we can now start timing these pulses and try to figure out what the rotation rate of the object is and whether there is a moon or exoplanet, I don't know what to call an object around a cold brown dwarf, whether there is a companion object which is inducing the radio emission in the same way Io induces radio emission of Jupiter, right? And so we can time these pulses and try to see if there is any periodicity in it, if there's any preference to some kind of a longitude. And basically the technique is exactly the same, uh, which people use many decades ago to say that hey, actually that component of Jupiter's emission comes from Io. So that's what we are after right now. Okay, last one before I end, I don't know how much time I have, maybe a few more minutes. Yeah, okay, so last one I wanna talk about is uh, again, a very low mass star, but this one is an extremely active star. So these are what we'll call flare stars. Uh, so you can think of this as a um, kind of a sun on steroids in terms of its flaring activity. And this star has an extremely strong magnetic field. It's four kilogauss. So the large scale field of the sun is one gauss. For Jupiter, it's, it's 15 gauss. And uh, this star has a four kilogauss field. Uh, and that's known extremely well because of Zeeman Doppler imaging. So we know exactly what its uh, magnetic field looks on the surface, what its morphology is and things like that, which means when we actually see the radio emission from the star, we can combine the knowledge from the Zeeman splitting and the radio to say a lot about what's happening in the corona, where in the corona the emission comes from and things like that. So here's the, again, the flux density versus frequency of, of this LOFAR data again on this star. And you can see that the star is very bright at low frequencies and within the low far band, it becomes fainter and fainter and disappears. And so we have done many repeats on this star and every time we see this star, we get the same spectrum. So the spectrum is actually telling us something. Why is it that the spectrum has this particular shape and where in the corona is the emission coming from? And it turns out that we can work a whole lot uh, uh, of what's happening in the corona and, and where the radio emission is coming from. So for example, we can show that this radio emission is coming from a distance, which is five times the stellar radius. So that's the height in the corona where the radiation is coming from. So immediately you can see that this star doesn't have a corona like the sun. The sun cannot confine plasma at a distance of five solar radii. The field lines are open and the plasma streams out. So this star, uh, um, already you know with the with the modeling of where the radio emission coming from where what the geometry is we can kind of say that in this star the closed field region so the field where uh, the region where the magnetic field lines are closed goes to about 10 or 20 stellar radii so you can already kind of say a lot about the coronal structure of the stars and why is all this important it's important because that steady wind which the sun always puts out we think that that exists on other stars as well but the strength of that wind really depends on not just the magnetic field, but the structure of the corona. And so if you can work out those details, things like how, how big is the closed field region, like we did in this paper, you can actually put that into the simulations of the stellar wind and start making statements about what kind of environment the exoplanets around the stars are experiencing. Uh, and so this is just an example of a simulation uh, done by a student at Leiden uh, who, you know, is use, using some of the constraints which we are giving them with the radio data and trying to make statements about what kind of wind pressure the planets around this star should expect or planets around these kind of stars. Right, so kind of wrapping up, there, there are many other things if, if you're interested, you know, we are finding all kinds of cool things. Uh, uh, just to give you uh, uh, an impression, uh, we've really opened up the low frequency window where all of these exciting signals are going to appear from this extrasolar system. And we have lots of detections like 30 stars, 
uh, 20 RSCVN systems. So these are really close binary stars. Uh, we have two brown dwarfs and counting. The more data we look at, the more we find. Uh, and a lot of this population was published recently in, in uh, Callingham et al. Uh, so we're really moving now into more of the follow-up campaigns, like finding the periodicity uh, and also pushing the second branch, which, which I didn't really speak about, where we are trying to find the stellar bursts to find uh, coronal mass ejections. Uh, so that's where we are all we're, we're going at this point. So I want to end with this slide where I kind of um, I kind of guess at I must say confidently guess that what the near future holds. Um, I think we'll in the near future with LOFAR, we should be able to say, answer the question of what determines an exoplanet's magnetic field strength. And we're going to do that by measuring the magnetic field strengths of a lot of these cold objects, like the coldest brown dwarfs, and really compare them to so-called dynamo models, which predict the magnetic field strengths of these objects, uh, and be able to say which kind of scaling law in the dynamo is correct. Uh, the second one is we should be able to say what kind of ac uh, what is accelerating plasma around these exoplanets is it you know is it the rotation is it the presence of a moon uh, we should be able to say that by timing those signals uh, kind of do the same things we did for jupiter like many decades ago uh, of course that will also answer the question you know do these cold brown dwarfs have whatever exomoons exoplanets i don't know what the right terminology is and can we detect them there will be a spectacular discovery if we can do it and lastly, you know, once we have the capability to look at these petabytes of data at high time resolution, we'll be able to say what is the intensity and rate of these coronal ejections on stars of different types and ages. Uh, and so I, I really think that all of this is gonna come in the near future. So kind of a five year horizon. Um, and, you know, the, the, the long-term future of course is to go to even lower frequencies and, you know, build a radio telescope on the moon or something like that. Uh, to find um, emission from an Earth-like exoplanet. Uh, but until we do that, we have a lot on our hands and a lot of exciting stuff. So I'll end there, thanks. Okay, thanks, Harish. Thanks very much, very interesting talk. I see several hands raised up already. So I didn't see who first raised their hand, but... Uh, Let's see, come in, you, you, you don't want to ask anything anymore? No? No, I was uh, virtually clapping. Ah, okay, sorry, there's claps. Okay, so Peijin has uh, his hand raised up, uh, raised up. so Peijin. Oh, uh, thanks, Harish, very nice talk. And uh, about uh, comparing uh, the um, exoplanet to a uh, Jupiter part, uh, as, uh, and uh, I, I kind of uh, remember that uh, um, the uh, uh, radio emission from uh, Jupiter um, have a very narrow beaming angle. Uh, is that also true on the exoplanet? Yes, I think it will be true uh, uh, because the emission mechanism is such. So the emission mechanism is the cyclotron measure instability, and it's uh, the instability is, is strongest in some directions. And, and so the emission ends up being beamed uh, close to being perpendicular to the magnetic field. So you can think of the emission going along the surface of a cone with a large opening angle. So that's kind of the beaming geometry. And the same will happen on exoplanets too, I think. Uh, uh, and we now think it, they happen on brown dwarfs as well uh, because it's a very similar process. The, the kind of practical implication of that is that if you look at a particular system and you don't detect anything, it's very hard to interpret a null result because it could be that it's radio bright, but you are not in the right geometry to view the radio emission. Uh, so in the lighthouse, example, if you're standing right on top of the lighthouse, you'll not see the beam, right? So something like that. So that's why this, this strategy which we're going after is quite interesting in that we're just observing the entire sky, right? So we'll see whatever systems are visible. Whatever systems are beamed towards the earth, we will catch them. Uh, so you know, putting that wide net is, is quite useful in terms, just strategically to, to overcome this problem of uh, this beaming geometry not being favorable in a given system. Yeah, also from the beaming geometry, um, 
can can we kind of uh, infer the geometry of uh, um, the moon and uh, the, the star, the, the geometry relation uh, along the uh, the line of sight or some kind of uh, uh, deduction yeah. yeah, what's happening? Yeah, that's yeah. a good question. So uh, uh, the answer is yes, but not exactly. Uh, so in the following sense, the, um, the opening angle of the cone I spoke about depends on the energy of the particles which are emitting yeah, so indeed. the lower energy particles have a wider a wider cone and the higher wider. energy particles have a narrower cone so you do make yeah. a reasonable assumption on that so you have a range of opening angles of the cone so although you can work out the inclination of the system from that it won't be an exact measurement so maybe you can say things like this one is you know a moderate inclination system high inclination low inclination things like that Oh, yeah, sure. And this is provided yeah, actually cool. that emission is induced by an interaction in a system because for right. some of the objects, you still don't know whether there right. is uh, uh, um, an orbiting body that is inducing, like in the G uh, Jupiter iodecometric uh, emission. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, like Tony said, we, we don't know in that there are some cases where we suspect that that's what is happening, but we don't have like, to, to really get the incontrovertible evidence, we need to do what we did for Jupiter and Io. So you need to keep staring at this object and timing those pulses. And so even though you get a pulse every rotation period, that entire pattern is modulated on a larger period given by the orbital phase of, of the planet or moon, if it is inducing the emission. So there is a way to tell if that is what is, that's what is happening. We just need to stare at the system for a long time to do that. Yeah, indeed. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Another another uh, question is about uh, the uh, uh, stellar uh, CME or other type of burst, and uh, uh, because uh, I, 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 in solar radio bursts there are um, very uh, the radio bursts uh, have very um, different uh, kind of a uh, uh, time scale. Some kind of uh, uh, short short burst that can uh, stay in uh, uh, milliseconds, and some long term burst that can stay for uh, hours or even days. Um, uh, what 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 do we, we expect from the stellar um, radio burst? Is, is that also the same or kind of different from the solar radio burst? Yeah, I mean the really honest answer is we don't know. Uh, the reason for that is um, in solar-like stars, it's reasonable to say you'll get solar-like activity. It's unclear yeah. what happens in stars which have a magnetic field of hundreds of Gauss or kilo Gauss. It could be that the alpha speed is so high in these stars that you never get a shock and you never get a type 2 burst. Or maybe by oh, the yeah. time you get a type 2 burst, the shock has already moved, I don't know, like 20 stellar radii or 100 stellar radii. I mean, sorry, not the not that the shock is more. That's where you form the shock, because that's when the alpha and speed falls. So the the short answer is we don't really know. Um, but the what what we are really looking for are type two and type three bursts. And the reason for that is if you see a frequency sweep like that, the interpretation is fairly unambiguous. Uh, it's a little hard to explain why you would get a frequency sweep like that. Uh, from anything other than either a beam and a two-stream instability from the beam or, um, or, or a shock moving through the corona and particle acceleration in the shock. Uh, so that's why we're really focusing on those two types of bursts because it has the biggest impact on modeling the climate or in some sense, it, it's the biggest unknown in modeling the climate or, or the atmosphere of exoplanets. Uh, and also it, it's, it's likely to be a very unambiguous uh, interpretation if we see a frequency sweep. Yeah, also it's a, also well-known uh, solar radio burst. Exactly, it's a well-known. So, so my own guess is, if I really have to guess right now, I think we are going to find these bursts on kind of a solar analog, which is a little younger than the sun. So it's more energetic uh, because we are just barely sensitive. So if you take the brightest solar uh, you know, radio burst ever detected, uh, we are just about sensitive to that from a nearby star, uh, which, you know, and that's very rare. Maybe that happens, maybe it's something like the Carrington event. It happens once every few decades or something, right? Uh, 
So yeah, in the whole well, survey, yeah, and in the whole survey, we'll have about 20 star years of exposure. So it's equivalent to looking at a star for 20 years, right? And so we we are going to either detect one of those, like solar energy kind of bursts, uh, but more likely we'll be finding stars which are much more energetic than the sun. So maybe a younger sun, uh, a, young, a young G dwarf, which is more which is more active uh, and has these what we would call super flares, like 10 to the 33 ergs or something like that of bolometric luminosity, 33, 34 ergs. Uh, I think that's the first thing we'll find most likely. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, thanks, uh, Harish. Even. Thanks, Pritin. Uh, very interesting mm -hmm. questions. Uh, Kamen has thanks, a question. Thanks. Yeah, very, very briefly. Uh, thank you, Harish. Very interesting presentation. Um, my question uh, goes one question back to um, talking about the, the, the source of the emission. Is there another way, another type of observation uh, that we can use to say what the, the emission is coming from, whether it's a brown dwarf or the interaction with a uh, uh, exomoon, let's say, a companion? Um, when you were discussing those pulses, I mean, is there another way to another to type out of observation? The, yeah, um, I can think of one maybe. So <laughs> we actually tried this uh, on Keck. Uh, I haven't reduced the data yet. So we got a really high SNR spectrum of the object. Uh, and the idea there is to see if in the spectrum we can tell that there are actually two objects there. So I'm now thinking of an equal mass or roughly equal mass binary, two T two T seven dwarfs or something like that. But if but if you look at the so so that would be a positive result would be quite conclusive because that's very rare to have such a tight binary, right? But a negative result there would be inconclusive in that if you look at the energetics of of the radio emission, all you need is like I don't know like a mercury size object, right? And that's going to be almost impossible to find uh, by other means. Partly also because it's hard to do radial velocities on brown dwarfs because they don't have narrow isolated lines. They just have a lot of forest of blended molecular lines, right? And so it's incredibly hard to do radial velocities to the point of finding a even like a Earth-like planet around, around this, let alone Mercury. So I think in the end, it'll have to come from periodicity in the radio and find, it'll have to come from finding two periods in that pulse. There's mm -hmm. a pulse arrival time, and there should be two, two periodic modulations. One has to be the rotation rate, and the other, there's nothing else. Right? The other has to be an orbital period. There's do no other think, mechanism we know of. Do you think any improvement could be made with uh, James Webb? Um, when it launches? Yeah, I think we might get better spectra. So I think it might be an improve. I haven't done the numbers. So I'm not 100% sure. But if we get like really accurate spectra with... Right. Should be much maybe, more sensitive than anything we have in infrared. Right, right, right. Definitely. Um, but again, there you're going a little bit on a prayer in that a positive result is fantastic, but a negative result is... is you can't interpret a negative result. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, one more question I see here, Timothy. Do we still have time for one? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so I just... Don't it has time and doesn't want to run away. Oh, okay. Uh, it's just a more of a basic question. So you mentioned like like those objects we got to observe, like these brown dwarfs or the red dwarfs or the like small exo the big exoplanets, they have a really strong magnetic field. Is there a particular reason for it? Or is it just part of the question that we are trying to ask? Or is it more the case that because we only see those strong magnetic field ones, so we thought that it's just all strongly magnetic? Ah, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's interesting. yeah, there is an observational bias, of course, in that all the observations so far were done at very high frequency. So you'd only find objects with strong magnetic field because you can't see the others. But anyway, but your question is more about the basic physical reason why we expect them to have strong magnetic fields. Yes. It has, yeah, so it, and there is a basic physical reason why we do expect that, because in the end, um, uh, the generation of the magnetic field uh, requires rotation. Uh, it does. It, it requires uh, an object that is rotating, but also has a conductive and convective fluid. If these three conditions are satisfied, you you generate a magnetic field. There should be a conductive fluid. It should be convective, 
and the object should be rotating fast enough. So the growth rate of the magnetic field that depends on the rotation of the object. If you look at a star like the sun, it's it puts out a lot of wind over its lifetime. So it loses a lot of angular momentum. So you can take a small amount of mass and throw it out to a large radius and lose a lot of angular momentum, you know, because angular momentum depends on the radius when you're rotating. But these objects like Jupiter or these brown dwarfs, they don't have strong winds. Uh, and so they never lose angular momentum. Uh, they kind of remain fast rotators. And that's the reason they end up having strong magnetic fields. And that, okay, so th th that's also why we expect like young stars to also have these strong magnetic fields as well because they don't lose too much. Yeah, because they still haven't lost their angular momentum, and it's also why as you go to colder and colder stars which have weaker and weaker winds, they well, let's put it this way: they lose their magnetic field over much longer time scales, which means that if you just take a snapshot of the universe, most of these red dwarf stars are still at a stage where they haven't lost most of their. Uh, rotational rate and magnetic field. Well, thanks. I think yeah, the bring that has a, is a bloody lot of them around, so <laughs> plenty of the ob objects to target. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, and I think one. I think one last question, the Brinka. Uh, hi, I actually have several questions and all of them are related to ExoMoon candidates and I have the time so I'm happy to sit here. Oh, okay, okay. well to start with the most important one, how realistic is it actually to find an ExoMoon candidate with LOFAR in the next few years, uh, especially given the fact that um, some of the closest uh, volcanic ExoMoon candidates uh, right now are respectively 65 and 550 light years away. And does it actually have to be a volcanic exomoon in order to be found with LOFAR? Ah, both, both are pretty interesting. So I'll take them in turn because there are two questions there. One is how likely. Uh, the really honest answer is nobody knows. <laughs> it's a little bit of an adventure, uh, but it's not an adventure without, you know, way stops in between in that uh, there are a lot of fruits to pick on the way to finding an exomoon. So it's not an all or nothing proposition. Uh, but the, the real honest answer is nobody knows because we don't know the incidence of having moons. We don't know their um, uh, the distribution of their orbits, how close they are, because to, to induce emission on, on, on one of these objects, you also have to be close enough. Uh, IO is just six Jovian radii away, right? So you need something which is close enough uh, to be able to, for the energetics to work in the system. Uh, so anyway, the, the real honest answer is no one knows. As to the point you made about, oh, you know, they might be really far. Actually, I would counter that and say, actually, nobody knows. Uh, it could be that the, it could be that, you know, the planets around Proxima have moons around them. I mean, we just don't know. There's, there's no easy way for us to know this. Uh, just like we haven't discovered all the exoplanets out there. Right, we've discovered 3000 of them. They're far more than that, of course. In the same way, we haven't discovered the exomoon. So we really don't know where they're going to be. Uh, they could all be, uh, th there's no reason to believe that they should be at hundreds of parsecs away. Um, yeah, I, I think there was a second part of your question, which I forgot. Can you repeat the second part of your question? Yeah, well, actually you mentioned some of the things that I was going to ask next. Uh, because I was going to ask uh, if you have to filter the all, all the exoplanets that we have right now and select the the first ones to be checked with um, low far for existing uh, volcanic or non-volcanic uh, exomoon candidates, mm -hmm. what kind of uh, preferences uh, would you put? I mean, like you mentioned the moon, um, it's better if it's uh, really close to its uh, planet. Uh, it will also help, I guess, if uh, the, the planet and the moon are really close to their whole star, because that will actually uh, induce even more uh, volcanic action on the on the moon. But what about the, the type of star? I guess it would be better if it's a younger star. What about the proximity of the, the whole system to us and the temperature maybe and the type of the planet? It, does it have to be um, some kind of a gas giant super or uh, hot Jupiter or something like that. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I, I think you can build in a lot of small probabilities or priors to increase your chances of detection. And 
that certainly makes sense what you just said. Um, what we've done so far is we've really cast like a very wide net because we already had the surveys going on and we said, we'll just look at the entire sky. The surveys, surveys are gonna cover the entire sky anyways. And each pointing is eight hours, right? And so the rotation rate of Jupiter is roughly 10 hours, uh, which means that many of these planets, we are roughly you know, covering a large fraction of the rotational phase. So this is basically, you know, in some sense, we are going to find everything there is to find anyways, even if we don't do a targeted observation. But to your point, it might make sense to do some kind of an analysis like that and do a much more targeted observations where we look at one object for 100 hours or something like that, right? So in that sense, that could be a complementary way of, uh, of picking a few candidates which we think are very promising and staring at them for you know, many tens of hours. Okay, thanks. And one last really short question. Uh, actually, how easy would it be to distinguish uh, an exomoon candidate from some kind of a ring around an exoplanet, for example, a ring of ionized gas or something like that? Ah, well, I think I, I can't imagine how you would get this second periodic modulation with a ring uh, because the reason why you get a modulation from an exomoon is precisely because the emission is beamed. So you need the, the current or, or the, let's say the moon to be in a particular geometrical phase with respect to your line of sight, such that the emission it induces is beamed towards you. But if you remove that and you have, have a ring which is at all azimuth angles, then you won't get that special orbital phase where where you preferentially see the emission so in that sense i don't think a ring will be or, or a torus plasma torus would be distinguishable from uh, the general case in jupiter actually in jupiter there is a plasma torus because the source of the plasma is io right and so there's a big torus around jupiter where there are a few uh, there's a range in radii where a lot of the plasma is uh, and that is spread in all azimuths. So you don't get this special second order modulation of the period because it's at all azimuths and there's no special azimuth. All right, thanks a lot. No worries. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Anybody else? Going once and going twice? No? Oh, sorry, a quick question. A real quick question is, uh, can we infer the, uh, uh, the beaming angle um, from the uh, light curve like, like we always do for Jupiter? Because- Yeah, uh, we, could, we could do that, I think. Uh, that's right. So we could infer a few things. So there are a few things. One is the magnetic obliquity in the system because the magnetic axis and the rotation axis need not be aligned. The second one is the opening angle of the beam and Maybe that's frequency dependent, but you know that's a second order complication. So if we have multi-frequency light curves, you could work out some of these angles in the system. Absolutely, I mean, it's been done, people have done this for Jupiter and there's no reason why we shouldn't do it for the other objects. Uh, but you would need multi-frequency light curves to do that. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think then, we can wrap up this uh, seminar. Thank you very much, Harish. That was very interesting. And um, I guess you give people ideas. That's OK, good. so now everybody's clapping. That, that's not <laughs> No, those are clapped, yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, and thank you very much, everyone. And hopefully, we'll see you at the next seminar that Cameron organizes. Yes, so stay tuned. Seminar. Yeah, and have a good evening. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for coming thanks, and thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.